summer is definitely the time for putting up food in the mountains of Appalachia. Lots of people still making a garden and lots of people still putting up food, um, putting up that bounty from your garden to enjoy during the winter months. Several months back, I did a little talk for a group of people at the Catawba Valley Community College. They were actually, they had been studying the book, um, the book of Book Woman of Troublesome Creek. Uh, may, many of you maybe have heard of the book or read it. It's a good book. I recommend it. But they'd been discussing that book and over a period of time, and they just wanted me to talk about Appalachian foodways that might have been used at that time when the book was set. So instead of, of course, it's a fiction book, and I can't know exactly what was going on in it, so instead of kind of uh, trying to elaborate on the things that were going on at that time, I kind of give an overview of the foodways of Appalachia, kind of a historic uh, overview of as far as putting up food and what people depended on to eat on a daily basis. Uh, the book had some unique, um, even though it was fiction, the, the people in the book mm -hmm. had a unique kind of struggle going on because of some prejudice that was against them. They were kind of fighting that constantly. And then also the mother had passed away, so there went a lot of the wealth of knowledge. Also, I would say it was um, being said at that time, that time period was a time when the people had large families, and that wasn't a large family. That was kind of two people against the wor world, the uh, daughter and the father there. But it is a really good book, so I, I suggest that you read it if you haven't. But I'm going to kind of go over with you what I talked about that day uh, with the college, folks from the college, just kind of a general overview of the foodways, uh, preserving foodways of Appalachia over the period of time from when that book was set, set probably in the early 30s till today. So, of course, in those days, the setting of the book, back in, you think of the, the 30s, the 20s, even before that, um, you know, the 1800s, 1900s, people in Appalachia lived like much of the rest of the world. They lived close to the land. They depended on, on what the land produced to feed their families. Um, you know, they, they had so much knowledge at that time about wild food stuffs. Of course, the easy ones that come to mind to me are, you know, black walnuts. Uh, the chestnut tree when it was still here, berries. They knew all the edible greens, all those kind of things. So they really had more of an intimate knowledge uh, about the land that they lived in. Also at that time, because it was such a, you know, there was no grocery stores. Even the stores were far and few between. Um, and, and it took money to, to buy stuff or barter and trade. You were trading what you had. But as I mentioned a moment ago, at that time, typically families were really large. Now in the book, it was just Cussie and her, her father, but those large families were um, really helpful when it come to gathering food stuff. So you imagine gathering walnuts to last through the years, black walnuts, um, gathering if you live in a place where there's pawpaws, maybe you're gathering them to make something out of them, uh, gathering the wild things, the wild berries that they could dry. All that was so labor intensive when you think about doing it to supply yourself food for an entire year. So typically in those days, families were large and every person had to, had to pull their weight. My papa Wade come from a, a large family, and he told Pap stories, and then Pap told them to me. Really, storytelling, handing down those stories is really a huge part of Appalachian culture. But about he grew up in the mountains of Madison County for a time, and, and, uh, and then also in Graham County before coming to the area where we're at now. But the, in the, his early days, of course, that was the chestnut trees were still producing. So he could remember uh, how easy it was to, to gather chestnuts to eat. They, you could just, if they were growing on a bank, maybe they rolled down into the road area. You could just walk down through there with a tow sack and pick them up. So they gathered chestnuts to feed their self, but also to feed their animals. That could be used as fodder for the animals they were raising, which in turn would turn around and feed them in that way with meat. So many of those, that knowledge of those food ways, wild edibles is just lost. You know, there are some people that still know them, uh, and I wish I knew more than I do. I try to gain that knowledge as I can by reading and researching and studying. But in those days, it was just such common, uh, common practice that, that everybody knew it. And it wasn't kind of like uh, a fad or anything. It was their very lives depended on having that knowledge. They had to know it, you know. They had to know it to make sure they had, had enough food to make do to make Make it through to the next growing season. Of course, uh, that nature's bounty grows in the summertime like it does now, but in those days, of course, everyone tried to grow a garden too, or they did. They kind of had to. They had to make a garden. 
And, and again, that was a place where, where those large families really helped aid in being able to make that garden. If you were lucky, you had oxen or a mule or something, or at least could borrow one to plow with. Um, but it took many hands to, to plant and, and to tend and to hoe and all those things to take care of stuff to, to produce that bounty for themselves to make it through the next winter when there would be no growing things either from nature or from the garden, but also for their animals. They always had to think about their livestock. A huge crop in those days in the mountains of Appalachia, where I live in the southern Appalachian mountains, uh, and I'm sure in, uh, throughout much of Appalachia, was corn. Corn was grown. I mean, it, you would not believe some of the pictures you can find, old pictures of um, where it's been documented, old farms especially comes to mind is the ones like where the TVA lakes where they, they documented some of the stuff before they, of course, had to build the dams and, and fill those areas with water. But how corn growing on these steep, steep hillsides is just amazing. Even where I live, up the creek where we love to go on a hike, there's some places where Pap told me corn grew when he was a boy, and I'd be like, really? Corn there? Because we think of these flat, you know, pristine, full sun gardens. Uh, and there certainly was some of that, especially people that lived in the bottom lands had that, uh, that great uh, land and great access to the flat parts, but that wasn't always the case. So there was many people that grew corn on, on really steep areas. And the reason they were so desperate to grow corn was because of that twofold uh, nature that I mentioned. It fed them. They could dry it. They could eat it fresh, of course. They could pickle it. They could uh, make hominy out of it. They could do all these things after they had dried it. It would be hominy or grits, those kind of things. Um, but as they dried it, they could then in the, throughout the winter, they could have it ground. So then they would have cornmeal so they could make cornbread or cornmeal mush. Um, just a variety of different ways to use it. But then also it fed their animals. Uh, fed the actual corn fed their animals, but also the, the, the corn stalk, the shocks of fodder. Pap told me great stories about uh, that time of the year when they would gather shocks of fodder to feed their animals. So when we think about putting up all those different food stuff, of course today we have canners, uh, pressure canners, cannon jars, and you know crocks and freezers and all those things that make it easy. When the early days of preserving food, uh, not just in Appalachia and other places too, but I can always only speak to Appalachia because that's the only place I've lived. But they utilized a lot of crocks. Now in the the beginning times, it would have been, uh, if you're watching along or reading along with us in Alex Stewart, they would have been wooden vessels, so wooden made out of wood, uh, whether that was like with staves like wood um, Alex describes making or some other type of wooden uh, container, and that's what they would ferment things in. So you think about kraut, making kraut, making pickle beans and corn, um, other things, and they would ferment and then uh, leave them in that while they eat off of them during the winter. As time went on, then the, the stone wire like crocs got more popular, so then those were handier, I guess, and easier maybe than the wood ones, although they were prone to breaking. We we're very fortunate we have Matt's grandmother's big croc. Uh, it's a really big one, and I have several little ones. Um, but anyway, that, so they began to use those. Well, then cannon jars come along, so then, then even in the most remote places, people began to gather uh, cannon jars and cannon jars are one of those wonderful things that if you have them you can just keep reusing them and reusing them and reusing them. I'm lucky that I, the ones that I have I've bought some along the way while I was married since I've been married all these years but I also got some from my from granny from uh, my mother-in-law from uh, people that didn't want their jars anymore. I have a dear friend, Jim Casta, when his wife passed away, um, well, really before she passed away, but she was sick, and he knew he didn't need all those jars anymore. He shared a bounty of them with me. So some of the jars that I use are really old, and I love thinking about how they've sustained uh, families here in Appalachia over the years, my own family, but also other families like the uh, friend of mine, like Jim Cassida, but other people too. And if I was at a yard sale or something and they had a jar for 10 cents, I pick it up. I love canning jars. I have a, a good supply, but it's because I do can a lot. But as time went on, people began to do that same thing in the mountains of Appalachia and these remote, remote areas even. And then they could, they could still utilize their crocs and their wooden vessels, but then they could take that stuff out and actually put it in a jar and can it, have its shelf stable there on the shelf, and then make another run of whatever it was in the crocs. So it, it really expanded their ability to put up food in an easier way. 
some people even granny's one of them even just went to um and she learned it from someone else it wasn't like she started it but she ferments actually in the jar she doesn't use a crock or a glass container or anything like i do she uses just actually does her fermenting inside the jar and once those jars become available pretty much anything you can think of they they put in a jar you know from can and berries to still still working on that nature's bounty part but also their potatoes their squash of course tomatoes and green beans all those things we think about today but so everything and meat uh, all those different things they once they could start utilizing cannon jars they certainly did that and like I said, it just made their life so much easier. Even though compared to today, in those days, they were still canning that stuff over either an open fire outside or a wood cook stove. Can't imagine the heat. Today, we have it easy with the, uh, the conveniences that we have. Another really useful thing that was used in those days was to dry things. So if you could dry something, you didn't have to put it in your limited jar supply, or if it was before jars, you didn't even have them. You didn't have to worry about using your crock so you could dry things. Um, apples and pumpkins, they would they would cut pumpkins and uh, kind of, you know, when you take the seeds out, it leaves around and then have those out where they would dry and then store them in sacks and then reconstitute those with water and that would be something they could eat during the um, winter months. The same with uh, green beans, leather britches we would call them. So all those things, drying was a huge part. They would dry berries, all those different things. Um, that you think about they were growing or gathering they could also be most of them could also be dried So when you think about fermenting in those crocks like I was talking about or the wooden vessels or the jars uh, People also used vinegar as a preservative a lot. So all those wonderful pickles We love today bread and butter pickles and uh, all those different kind of about anything you can think of from pickled okra to pickled watermelon rind all those things so that was another method of pre preservation was using vinegar and then of course there was pre preserving with sugar making jelly like I love to make today you know whether it was from the nature's bounty or maybe they had an apple tree um, or they had planted some other type of fruit you know lucky enough to get some seeds and plant those or have get a tree from someone or someone donated them or they moved to an area where there was fruit a lot of times in those days people People. even though uh, many families stayed put there was families like my father's family who kind of moved all over Brasstown until they did stay put here in Wilson Holler so they were lucky if they moved to a, a new house and it had a, a black walnut tree and an apple tree so sometimes that that was also a, a um, the, the things that were on hand from nature was kind of might have been planted by somebody else but there they ended up being able to be utilized by that family when they moved there one of those wild food stuffs that Pap would tell me stories about uh, and he taught me about and I've utilized myself is what we call fox grapes and they grow along the creek here. Uh, it's a pretty good sized grape, very tart, not a very sweet grape, but makes wonderful uh, jellies. It's just wonderful. Uh, a lot of times you have to fight to get them though from the coons and the possums and the things like that but they they're really wonderful but in those days when pap was a boy of course as i mentioned things were you had to make sure you got them so they tried harder than i do today anyway he, he would go with his big grandmother uh, or big grandma's what we called her i don't know if he called her i guess he called her big grandma too Anyway, it was his grandmother, Carrie, and he would help her. She would put him up in the trees because he was, uh, you know, just a small boy so that he could pick them for her. And then they would make jellies and they would make juice out of them. Him and um, his big grandma and then her daughter, Pat's mother, Marie. But he said there was one thing he made, they made out of them that he just could not stand. And it was they would layer them in a crock. It was like fermented grapes, kind of like grape pickles. They would layer them in a crock with uh, also used the grape leaves which you'll often see recipes even today say to use if you can use a grapevine leaf it helps things ensure that they stay crunchy it something in them you know makes everything stay more crunchy helps them from uh, to retain the firmness whatever it is that you're pickling anyway but he said they were just horrid he hated them but they had to eat them that was one of the things you could get a lot of grapes and put them in a crock and that was you know that was something that would sustain you through the winter but he always told me said I was sure glad when better times come along and we could do away with that and they didn't do it anymore and the fact that they didn't do it anymore it made me realize they probably didn't like it either but in those days you, you had to be couldn't be as picky as we are today you had to make do with what you had on hand 
So along with sugar used for to make those jellies and jams I was talking about as a preservation, people also use for sweetening. Of course, they used honey and they used sorghum, sorghum syrup in my area. Sorghum is what is grown. Now, uh, we would just call it syrup. That's what I grew, called it when I was growing up. It gets confusing because a lot of people call it molasses. Molasses is technically made from sugar cane, but people interchange it so much that... Uh, and it just depends on where you were raised and what your family said. But anyway, those those type of sweetenings, honey and sorghum, and uh, of course sugar was also used uh, in the preservation method and just also as a food waste. So if you didn't have sugar, which was in those early days, as time went on, it was easier to acquire, but in those early days was um, something that was sometimes hard to get, then you enjoyed honey, you enjoyed uh, sorghum. People kept bees, my Papa Wade did, not in my lifetime, but when Pap was a boy, and Pap Papa Wade was supposed to be one of those people, or was, I've heard Pap tell the story, that he could he would course bees. So what that means is, in those days, again, you weren't just going to the store or ordering your, you know, I want to order a hive of bees and get started in beekeeping. So you had to get your own. A lot of times people would catch their, catch wild bees and then bring them home in a, in a bee gum. And so if you, you'd watch near a body of water maybe near the creek watch for bees to come to drink and then try to follow them back it was a real process i can't even believe i've always wanted to do it but then i can't imagine what tenacity uh, and determination that would take and there's different little tricks they would like sprinkle some flour on their wings so then when they flew you could better see them and it was like you had to keep following them to you know you'd lose them then maybe you'd bring a bucket of water and they'd come to there it was a whole process but then when you found them you could bring them back home hopefully catch the whole hive and bring them back home and then you would have honey there at your home so when it come to meat uh, most people had chickens, they had hogs, and but overall, the most popular type of meat in the Appalachia region was pork. That's what it was, was pork. And, you know, there's so many kind of caricatures and different things like, uh, you know, even... I don't know if it's even a caricature, but like you always got to have like of this mountaineer going out and hunting and getting the squirrels and getting the groundhogs and they've always got meat, possum meat, whatever it is. But the truth is a lot of times their meals were meatless, but um, you know, cause you think about in those days, everyone was hunting that game. They certainly did hunt squirrels and uh, eat groundhogs and even possums and all that, that. but it was very scarce in those days because everyone was hunting it. So a lot of times their meals were meatless. They didn't have meat. But pork was one that they could raise themselves and then put that meat up so then they got to enjoy it for the whole year. And a variety of different ways when it comes to putting up the pork. Of course, that freshness, uh, Pap said hog killing time was something they just so looked forward to because it was like a, almost like a party because people would come and help and... Um, and bring food and everybody would gather together and pitch in and and you know it was a arduous task to actually kill a hog and then prepare the meat for storage uh, for long-term storage so there was that freshness though they would always have you know a pan of tenderloin the women would make souse meat out of the head and different parts that's left over and that was something you eat pretty quickly but then there was the, they'd can backbones and ribs, they would make sausage, they would uh, sugar cure or salt cure or both the ham. So that was, that was a way that they could, they could ensure that that meat was ready um, for them to eat, but also to enjoy through the year kind of putting up the meat part. So primarily the main meat in those early days especially that was eaten was pork. So in those days when they did have to, uh, you know, you think about the sugar and the things that they needed in those early days, the, the real uh, system was barter and trade. You bartered and trade for what you wanted. Pap told me stories of when he was born. He was born on the Hawshaw farm here, and um, that was where his first years were at. His father and his grandfather were sharecroppers there, but he could remember with his mother fishing in the river, in the Hawassee River there, and then taking the fish to the big house, is what Pap called it, the big house, and there she would trade them the fish for butter or for sugar or for what they needed. So in those early days, that was 
that was really all there was, was the barter system. Pap said in, in a year's time, maybe $40 would go through his daddy's hands, maybe $40. Uh, but people just didn't, it was just, that was just the way of the world. Of course, as time went on, that drastically changed and, and people got to where they could go purchase those things they needed, whether it was uh, the sugar or the cannon jars or all those different things and not worry so much about the barter and trade. And uh, there's no, <laughs> there's no use debating about it really because it just is what it is you know kind of thing but sometimes I wonder if we're if if that was progress or not of course it was progress in so many ways um, when you think about health care and um, you know the ease at which we live we don't have to worry so much about those things but then yet we lost something too if that makes sense so in today's world, of course, you know, what you think, well, what's going on? Things so, so many things have changed, as I mentioned. <clears throat> well, in my area of Appalachia, and certainly in my family, that putting up food is still alive and well. Um, I, I dry things, I ferment things, I can things. We can, we don't have room for hogs, and uh, we do have chickens, but we don't raise meat chickens. Uh, something hopefully we can do in the future, but thus far we just use chickens for eggs. Um, but the primary meat that we that Matt gathers for us or harvest is deer, and we we do can the deer. Uh, we freeze some, but mostly we can it. We we love the ease of opening a jar of deer meat. It's so delicious too. It's so great. But so uh, there are people certainly that still have hogs and 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 have hog killing day that have chickens that they process. There's certainly still people like that. Uh, and in the last few years, or probably even five or six years, I would say there's a, been like a kind of a resurgence, kind of wanting to go back to some of those old ways to be more self-sufficient. Definitely, there's been a resurgence in fermenting because of the health benefits. So it's like fermenting is all the rage there for a while. And those, mostly that was people doing it for health reasons, not because they needed it to sustain them through the winter. And they were doing it in those, you know, small, small batches like a cannon jar. So when you think about all these, like, you know, and this is just kind of a really quick overview of the kind of the history of the foodways in, in, in the Appalachian Mountains, um, just a very general overview. But when you think about, you know, go back to those vessels that Alex Stewart made. Uh, or whoever was making them, but since we've re been reading about him, all the way to today's cannon jars or the fancy kind of fermented things you can get with the, I don't, I don't have one, but like with the airlock and how it releases gases and all that. So much knowledge in between then and now. And so many things have changed. Um, not, I mean, specifically talking about the way people put up food now, not just, of course, we know the world's drastically changed. But... I watched a fascinating video the other day. I just it just popped up somehow, and I just happened to see it. And the the name of the channel, and I will link below so you can go watch it. I thought it was very interesting. I never watched one of this lady's uh, videos before. I don't even know what her name is, but she's very um, open, very friendly, and very, seems very nice uh, and very knowledgeable. So she lives. I'm not sure where she lives, but she lives near a uh, population of uh, Amish and Mennonites. So, and she is a canner, a homesteader, but she was, her video, what caught my attention was it was like canon about like the Amish do. Well, I've always been fascinated by those changes that I was talking about from those days of Alex Stewart or the days of the um, setting of the Troublesome Creek or when Pap was a boy till today. Now, I learned how to can from my mother, who learned how to can from her mother, who I'm sure learned how to can from her mother. You know, it's just been passed down. Uh, and, and so I do things the way Granny does them. Well, uh, go back to 2008 when I first started writing for on the Blind Pig and the Acorn. It didn't take me very long at all to realize that... Um, the way that Granny and I do things are not um, the way it would be. You would be told to do it in a canon book by experts, you know, by scientists, by all those people. Well, you know, I thought about that and I thought, well, but am I going to? I'm not going to change the way I do things though because it's I've I've grew up. You know, I I'm now I'm 50. I wasn't 50 then, but but for all these years, my mother did it. My mama did it. My granny did it. And then when I met Matt, his mother did it. So I'm not going to change, but it is really interesting, you know, really fascinating. <clears throat> and I also learned really quickly 
that people have get very very opinionated <laughs> about how you how you do process food which they should i mean you know everybody should have their own way and it is a serious thing because you wouldn't want to poison somebody you wouldn't want to make somebody sick all those kind of things but so her video is kind of on going on that premise so she had a friend that was um an Amish lady and then so the Amish you think and I don't know very much about Amish people or anything but I do know that they live a very simple lifestyle so uh, they don't have according to the video which you can go watch but they don't have you know they don't use pressure cookers is her main point of her videos the pressure cooker part so they water bath everything and so it's really fascinating video and she was by no means telling anybody else to water bath their meat or to water bath their cannon or their green beans or anything she was just kind of giving an overview and what happened is she received so many just um she kind of went viral but in a in a good way but then also in a bad way with some people just being really really mean to her that she was you know just to, uh, really misinforming people when she wasn't she made it cl very clear that every person has to decide what's best for their family and their kitchen uh, but she was just sharing it well it reminded me of uh, years ago like I said I didn't uh, we don't have hogs now and pap and granny I think once or twice maybe I don't even remember if it was pap and granny though so I can't even say that but someone in the holler had hogs it's my papa Wade and maybe somebody else at one time because uh, I remember them being down there but I don't remember being part of the hog killing day and maybe they took them to a processor I have no memory of that anyway so I didn't have much knowledge of that but when I met Matt and got married and everything his family would often talk about they did raise hogs and they had hog killing day every year and put them up and they talk about the wonderful wonderful sausage how oh you just couldn't get sausage like that anymore and then they would talk about how they canned it so how they canned it was they um, of course they killed the hog and they processed the meat and all that and then they mixed their spices in and then they would as a you know again large family all come together to do these kind of things they would fry that sausage up pans at a time then they would put it in a cannon jar you know the little patties or some people do balls patties or balls and put it in the cannon jar maybe about five high or something and then pour that hot grease over it seal it up turn it upside down and that's it nothing they didn't can it they didn't water bath it they didn't do anything so when they first I, you know i kept asking are you you know i asked like three i asked matt's daddy i asked matt i asked matt's mother i asked all it's like are you sure what how how did you not die you know whatever so then i began to ask other people uh there was a uh, and and you know kind of research and found yeah lots of people did it that way so one day I was over it, uh, it's no longer there, it's a different name now, but Chambers, when Chambers, when the Chambers family actually still owned it, is a slaughterhouse just over the Georgia line from us. And I was in there one day, and um, I don't remember how the subject of sausage come up, but the older cham Chambers lady was there. So I asked her, I said, did you ever can sausage? She said, oh yeah, honey, we can sausage every year. I said, could you tell me how to do it? I'm just curious. She said, well, you take your patty, you know, pat out your patties, you fry them up, you put them in a cannon jar, sterilized jar, you put them in there, you pour the grease over them, and then you turn them up, seal them up good and tight, and you turn them upside down. So it was the same way as Matt's family. So um, not long after that, Matt and his daddy, Papa Tony, they bought some uh, pork and they made sausage. And I said, well, since we're going to go through this process of making the sausage, I want to do that. And then I want to see, you know, how it tastes and, and see what it's like. So we did. We made like two runs of sausage, canning them. I mean, that old timey method. And then I was like, oh, then the first day I was going to open them up and cook them for breakfast. I thought, okay, or, you know, I may be about to kill my family. We'll see. Uh, but of course none of us died and it was so good I don't know what that process does to it but oh my goodness so tender and so good so after that I wrote about it on the blind pig and the acorn and I said you know seems like it should kill you and then a lot of people said that's how their mother and their grandmother and all these people did it anyway so that was just like one of the things that I've always been fascinated and and her video kind of uh, shed a different light on it because she's talking about things I don't really uh, you know like the Amish and all that and of course I don't know her but uh, it's fascinating how over time 
the method of preserving food. And again, I think you should be safe. I definitely should. I'm just not so sure you should throw all that knowledge out the window that come before us is what I'm trying to say, I guess. You know, when I, I think about it like the sausage, and we don't have hogs, so I'm not making sausage very often. But I know there's people out there that still do it that way. Um, and a point that she made was there's the Amish. I'm not sure <clears throat> how they do their sausage. She was talking about them canning meat at, in a water bath canner. Um, but then in other parts of the world, people still use those kind of canning methods. You can find videos on YouTube. I've watched them sometimes. Even um, there's some where nobody's talking, but they're just doing stuff. And you can see what they're doing and they're canning and they're not doing like what, you know, what would be advised to do today in the United States. Uh, and they're obviously older people and they're alive and well. So it's just something fascinating to think about. I guess I think there should be maybe an in-between, maybe. Uh, and it's interesting, go, go back to the blind pig and the acorn, over the years, I learned really quickly I had to explain how I do, like even for the jelly, I have several jelly vi videos, and I do not water bath can my, video, my jelly because I didn't grow up in a family that do that. So I have to um, kind of explain over and over that, first I always say, you know, they tell you not to do this, so you should do your own research, do your own due diligence, and you should do things the way you feel comfortable doing them. I feel comfortable doing it the way I do because I was raised like that, because I have this storehouse of knowledge behind me um, with my mother, my grandmother's, Matt's family, uh, and now myself that I've been canning for so long. And, you know, again, somebody might say, well, you've just not it's just not happened that you got sick yet, but you will get sick. And they may be, that may be true, but that's still my decision that I have to make for myself, just like you have to have to make it uh, for yourself. But anyway, I learned really quickly to point out that I use the open kettle method of canning when I can jelly. It means my jelly is really, really hot. My jars are hot. My rings are hot. Uh, my lids are warm, at least, because I dip them in the uh, boiling water there and then as it all cools down it forms a vacuum inside the jar and it pops the lid and it seals it so that's how, what that is now um, in in the early days so I still do that now granny and miss Cindy and my mama and my granny and all them they do that same method if they're making tomatoes if they're just canning tomatoes um, for berries for I wish I could think off the top of my head for kraut and for some pickles, for all those kind of things. That's all they do. I found, um, like for my tomatoes, most of the time I do either can them or pressure can or water bath them because sometimes when I just do that open kettle method, they don't last as long. The, it somehow, the, it, they just go bad. It's what I experienced one year. So I didn't want to do all that work again, so I started water bath canning and, or pressure canning. It's kind of like... Um, the water bath cannon like for green beans I still believe you could do that safely like the Amish people are doing but it just takes three hours <laughs> three hours so you compare that to the time that it would take I canned green beans yesterday the time it would take to actually can them in a pressure canner is much much faster compared to that three hours so for me that's kind of like a no-brainer well this the tomatoes are kind of like that anyway um, so you, you can think about it like the, that open, like the open kettle method. I could explain that to people, but then people still say, well, that's really dangerous and you may die. Um, and, you know, and it even in her video, the lady, nice lady's video, she even says, you know, when she first, and she calls this type of cannon, like the open kettle or definitely that sausage, or even the water, using a water bath canner instead of a... Um, pressure canner she calls it rebel cannon I've never heard of that I told Matt I was like do you know I'm I found out I'm a rebel canner canner and he said what I said then I explained it to him but rebel canning I've never heard that before but rebel canning is what she says is the term anyway she says when she first found out about that her immediate thought was well I wonder if it because the Amish live differently like their genetic makeup is different somehow and they're not susceptible to getting sick or maybe those people in Germany are different and they're not you know, wherever it is uh, that they're not using these um, modern day canon expert, what they would tell you. She said maybe they're, they're made up different. She thought maybe that was it. But then as she began to research and, and understand, uh, again, she's not telling anybody that they should do that. She just become kind of like I am, where you should take, definitely take modern instruction, but you should also take the wisdom of your elders or the wisdom of people near you who've been doing this for many, many generations.
And even in the subset of whether you use the pressure canner and do everything just like the Canon books tell you, um, or you do a mixture kind of like I do, there's so many variations on things and people have so many different opinions. Um, and it's just one of those things uh, again, you need to be careful because you don't want to poison yourself, but you could say that about anything. You need to be careful running a sewing machine because you don't want to sew your fingers, but there's nothing like experience. You need to figure out what works best for you and for your family uh, within reason. Of course, you're not, you know, you, people always have to have to uh, have a disclaimer by saying that, but then sometimes you're like, well, within reason, you know, you're not going to uh, go out. Um, and jump off the roof, right? I mean, you'll kill yourself. So people do have com more common sense than we give them credit for. So you've got to figure out what works best for, for your family. But another thing um, that I've noticed with the Canon thing, you know, is it like about the lids? I've heard some, some people say, you've got to take the rings. You've got to take them off. I've heard other older ladies say, oh, honey, no, I leave the rings on because it keeps the lid down really tight. Well, you could say, well, they don't know what they're talking about, but then you're like, but wait a minute, they've been canning for 65 years and fed, you know, they've raised 12 kids and, you know, 30 grandkids. Uh, they, I got to give them credit. They, they're doing something right. They're at least doing something right that works for their family. Uh, Pastor Lawn, the other day on one of his videos, he had, a, he was talking about uh, planting and digging potatoes, but he again said, just because you, at the end of the day, what matters is if you have potatoes in the bucket, not how you got there. So I guess it's kind of like that. I'm looking at it kind of like that with the cannon. Uh, as long as you're feeding your family and they're well, it don't really matter how you got there, which hoops you jump through to get there when it comes to uh, preserving and canning. Um, another thing that's different is when I was growing up and Granny would water bath can some things, um, she would put the water up to just to barely to the um, neck of the jar whatever it was if it was pickles or something today they say you got to have it like two inches above so i think about all those pickles i enjoyed my whole life and think well none of them were cooked like that they were you know so there's just so many different little uh variations that you'll see people do so and oftentimes it's because that's how my mother did it i mean that's how i make jellies because that's how granny taught me to do it so there's so many different little things like that, and you could throw them all out, out, you know, throw them the water out with the baby. It's kind of, it's kind of one of those things. But I'm not going to throw all that knowledge out because of the um, modern day experts. Now, again, you have to do what what you feel comfortable doing, um, and and make it. T Make It Make, I think is the name of her channel. It, she points out that if you're a very beginner canner, you should follow those things till you feel more comfortable. And I, I agree with that. But I also would say you should seek out someone in your community, if it's not someone in your family, and ask them how they preserved food. You know, I really love my dehydrator, but in the days gone by, there was no dehydrator. So you think about people laying the apple peel, apple slices or whatever they were drying out. Maybe they didn't have anything to keep the flies off of it. Maybe they did. Maybe they had to, and you know, there's just so many different little tricks that you would learn. Um, but I know there's knowledge in that, that wisdom of, of the ages of the people that have been doing it for so long, like the Amish lady who's really dependent on that to feed her family, um, that the kind YouTuber, the creator there, uh, interviewed and, t and talked to about Canon. So it's just a fascinating subject. It's really got my, you can tell, uh, something I've really thought about a lot. Um, I love to provide food for my family. I love to make a garden and to put up the bounty. Um, I loved it when I was young. I complained about it sometimes, but then other times I would really feel like I was living out Little House on the Prairie when I helped Granny and Pap in the garden and helped harvest the beans, helped break them up, helped can. Um, and, and I think part of my great joy comes there is just nothing in the world Granny loves better than canned green beans. She's the green bean queen. She loves it. And I, I think I get part of that. And she was all, she's so excited if she gets some, you know, got some berries. She used to pick blackberries when I was a kid and harvest black walnuts. You know, she, I learned all this from her. But she would get so excited about it. And just like she had been given the, the best Christmas present in the world, you know, every time she got a, a bushel of green beans to can or a bucket of blackberries to put up or a, a bucket of black walnuts to go through and harvest. It was just like the best Christmas present ever. 
and I think I inherited that from her. That's how I feel. Uh, it's just such a joy to be that close to your food and kind of goes back to what I was saying. Of course, with in modern life, we have so much to be thankful for, but then there is that something that seems like we've lost since those early days. And, and I think that is part of it, being so connected to your food and, and to yourself, to self-sufficiency, whether that's cutting wood, you know, to build your own fires in the winter or, or to har make a garden to harvest your food. It's just a really rewarding thing. Uh, it brings me great joy. So I hope that you enjoyed this. I hope you'll leave a comment and share any of the ways that your family preserves food, any of the history, uh, and your thoughts about, uh, you know, the various different ways. Are you a strict go-by-the-book kind of canner? Or, or are you like me and you're kind of in between? You know things like pressure canners. What a wonder, what a wondrous thing to be able to use a pressure canner and not have to have, to have that long cook time for things. But then also, you kind of can't discount all that wonderful knowledge that has been, been gathered and garnered and distilled and passed down through the generations, especially in the Appalachian culture. It's just such a huge part of the culture to pass down that knowledge. So please leave me a comment and share those things. And as always, I hope you'll just keep dropping back by often to help me celebrate Appalachia.